and this is a, a overused word, but an important concept, and that's intersectionality. So spine, I personally believe, is an organ system, and it's truly at the crossroads of skull to extremities and all the internal organ systems in between. And we, for a long time, had this uh, foundational struggle between ortho and neurosurgery, but I think that's in the rear view mirror. I think this room here shows that we're really, actually really great together. But we overlooked totally, for instance, pediatric surgery, so it's really cool to have a true pediatric uh, spine surgeon and surgeon here. But the other angle was, uh, for instance, our trauma surgeons. And they actually have a very high degree of sophistication in many regards, uh, injury loads, trauma, uh, trauma burden in terms of the magnitude of the surgeries we impart on patients. But uh, it is so cool to have Dr. Woody Cross here from Mayo, because he's one of those uh, uh, visionaries who's taking a concept that was born, I think, in the US out of Harborview's work into the next level. And for you, it's important, I think, to see that something that is heavily hyped by industry has good foundations in terms of its pathophysiology, but where we should not just listen to the industry hype, but should really exert excellent surgical skills, starting with decision making, but then execution. So Woody has been an immediate hit when he started joining us here with his SI joint work, and li really looking forward to learning from you. Thanks for being here, Woody. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to deliver this talk here to this audience and, and, and the people that are learning because I, you know, it's, it is clear the SI joint is there and we had a great talk by Dr. Sensory yesterday, but I think you, we, you can miss and a lot of patients are getting SI joint fixation or surgery and they don't need it or, or they're getting other stuff done and it's been the SI joint all along. So my goal today is you know, from an orthopedic perspective to talk about SI joint pathology and recognizing it and then how you treat it. So. Um, We'll talk about the anatomy, what else can masquerade as SI joint pain, diagnostic strategies, and then and how to treat it. And I want, there's an exam QR code, so get your phones ready because the QR code will be up there. And I want you to scan this and I want you to watch that video on how to examine the SI joint. And we'll talk about all those maneuvers. I do have a disclosure. I helped kind of design this uh, revision system or the primary SI joint fusion system by osteocentric. So just uh, um, keep uh, keep an eye out on that on that bias. But my journey, like, why am I here? You know, I was uh, went, went to University of Minnesota, and uh, some of my mem my mentors are up there. Harbor U Trauma Fellow, where I met Dr. Chapman. But you can see kind of some hallmarks of SI joint pathology. And in my residency, you know, I did a lot of SI joint work open with big open lateral windows through the pelvis to the corticate. And so I kind of got into this uh, uh, realm early and then kind of investigated these, this uh, MIS world. And it's really grown since the 2011 when I first started experimenting and looking at how to do this less invasively instead of going in through the pelvis, like the old ilioinguinal approaches with the lateral window. I mean, it's a big, big surgery. And so since then, you know, it's uh, been over you know, a thousand uh, surgeries for uh, SI joint stuff. So a lot of my revision practices is growing dramatically as now we're putting in more and more of these implants. And so this, our clinic at Mayo Clinic has really grown to be this international national hub, which has been really, uh, really exciting. We're in a good field because the spectrum of SI joint disease is huge. And if you look at complaints of patients, uh, what's wrong with them, it's all musculoskeletal. And if you look at the musculoskeletal, it's the majority of the back. And so SI joint pain and back pain is there and it's real and I think we really have to learn how to diagnose this. And when we look at SI joint disease, the spectrum of what causes it is massive and there continues to be, despite all this research, a lack of consensus on what's really causing SI joint pain, what's the right workup of SI joint pain, and this is what's leading to inappropriate surgeries and uh, infusions. And we alluded to this yesterday with our talk about that there's a third of patients that come in and see you in your clinic and it's, it's, you know, it's the SI joint, it's not necessarily the back or radiculopathy, and the onus is on you to try and figure out what it is so you can get them the right treatment. And these are some of the same papers we talked about yesterday, but we know that patients, even if they get spine surgery, they may not be addressing the SI joint appropriately, and it could be the SI joint all along, yet they got a 4.5 or a 4.1, and they still have, and they're no better. Or they were better for a little bit, and then the SI joint picked up. So it, uh, it really onuses on us. This is kind of the title of my talk, and this is what my favorite thing to tell my residents and fellows is the eye only sees what the mind knows. If you're not thinking SI joint disease, it's looking right at you, and, and you'll miss it. So you really have to have this awareness of what can look like SI joint pain and how do you work it up and diagnose it. The SI joint is definitely unique, and you know if it's the largest axial joint in the body in terms of surface area, it's a synovial joint, it has joint fluid, 
And, uh, and this whole articular segment uh, right along here is all full of cartilage. And that's what we really want to, that's where the concept is we think some of it's coming from. But there's also, you know, this complex ligamentous structures. And there's some theories that it's coming from the inflamed capsule and the ligaments too. So um, really kind of knowing where all these ligaments are and uh, what their role is with stability of the SI joint is, uh, is really critical, especially for us as, as trauma surgeons putting a pelvis back together again, you know, we're, lo we're looking at some of these uh, structures. It's also incredibly important for you guys to recognize what a dysmorphic sacrum looks like because some of the injuries that come in that I see as revisions are from implants that are placed right through L5 because they think a dysmorphic sacrum is just like every other sacrum, but it's not. And you really have to know what a sacral dysmorph. And I put this slide in last night just because a lot of us are, you know, a lot of you are trainees, but you have to recognize a dysmorph or you're going to take out L5 or S1 and not even know it. So you need to get a, uh, you know, the outlet radiograph and look at these five uh, key findings of the dysmorphic sacrum. The, the, the CT scan on every single patient gets this kind of tongue and groove articulation, which is unique to that iliosacral anatomy. And on the lateral view, you'll see this big sacral promontory. These are the hallmarks. You have you know, the, the disc spaces at the top of the iliac crests. All right, you have these kind of mammillary bodies or the residual TPs uh, on uh, the upper sacral segment, oddly, bizarrely misshapen S1 foramina. You have a residual uh, disc space uh, there at that, uh, at that transitional segment. So, and these, these real acute alar slopes. And this is a critical finding on your inlet views to kind of determine where you're gonna go because L5 is no, is sitting right there. And if you don't recognize that, your, your, your cranial implant could wipe that out. The SI joint doesn't move like a normal joint. And I just love this one where if you have this intact, uh, you have this intact um, pelvis, it barely moves. And you look at gap displacement for millimeters, it's moving just a point, not even a millimeter displacement. And angular rotation is only you know, 0.5 to 1 degrees in rotation. So the SI joint is incredibly stable. So just the subtlest movement can cause pain in that area. So what causes SI joint pain? It's all over the map. And really, any of these sources can, uh, can be caused, but you have to recognize what can cause it because if you're not getting a good history, you could be listening to this history and missing it right along. In my practice, just like uh, Dr. Sensor's practice, these are kind of the hallmarks on what, on what comes in my practice uh, with the idiopathic you know, being, uh, being a big one too. They don't know what causes it. When they come into my practice, everybody gets these images. These are the hallmark images of an SI joint workup with your AP inlet and outlet views. Outlet to kind of look for dysmorphism and other pathology that we'll talk about in a second. And then they all get the axial and coronal obliques uh, on the CT scan. Every single patient gets this. That's, uh, that's a requirement. And then they also get single leg stance views to look for pelvic instability. This is a great case for postpartum patient with single leg stance views. That is an unstable pelvis, okay? That's what happens when they, you can see when she puts one, stands on one leg, stands on the other leg, her whole anterior ring shifts. So this is really a setup and that, uh, that opens a whole nother unique of problems. You cannot rely, however, on just on imaging. And one of my buddies from fellowship wrote this article up where they looked at all asymptomatic CT scans on, on just pulled a bunch of them and looked at them. And they found that the vast majority of people, as you get older, even though they have no symptoms, have incredible amounts of degeneration in their CT scan. So just the presence of imaging alone doesn't mean anything. It's all about the, the, the coordination of the exam, the injection, which we'll talk about, and imaging. It's, this, it's the total package, which what makes the diagnosis, not just a, a, a biopsy of what you're looking on the imaging. So that's why I contend that the exam is the most critical part of the SI joint uh, workup. And the history, you can see we got drew this up. This is, looks like a ridiculous pattern, but it's not. This is absolutely classic SI joint pain. And if they could run their hand down their leg like this, you can be thinking, oh, you have a, five, you know, a, a radiculopathy, but it's not. It can be SI joint pain. This is that classic seating thoughts we talked about yesterday. You can walk in the room and they're sitting like this. And this is SI joint pain. It is just completely classic. Um, all of these are the provocative tests that you can do and you probably should do to recognize some of them, but they're all over the map. And if you look at the list of what really works, nothing works. It's all, it's all the combination of them together as a package which kind of puts it together. So I kind of I kind of divide my evaluations into three, where there are seating and balance when I walk in, and then if they're standing, I do this kind of standing test, and then, and then Dr. Chapman told me about this drop test, which I started to do, which, which, which actually is pretty impressive. And then supine, in the video, which I'll show you next, is these, you gotta go in order uh, with those tests there, and if, if they're 
three of five or three of six positive, they have, they have the disease as far as I'm concerned. So um, if we have time, we can watch this later on, but that's this QR code. I think you should really scan. It's a YouTube video that we shot and exactly how we do the Mayo Clinic SI joint test. But it's like a two or three minute video or you can just Google it and, uh, and find it. But it's really, uh, that's, that's how you do that, uh, that test. The seals the deal issue is the injection. And I think that this is critical as sort of the last step. So if you're suspecting SI joint disease, the injection kind of helps you. But it's incredibly technically difficult to get a good one. And you need to find your, your person to give you a good injection. Because if you're getting an injection like this, this helps nobody. I, I, if they're, if, who's not going to have some relief there if you anesthetize the entire you know, hemipelvis? What you want is this, where you get a well-placed injection into the SI joint with perfect diffusion of the injectate in the joint. And that's what you want. And then you want a report like this, where they contact, or they touch base with that person right afterwards, and they tell what happened to their pain. Their pain went from a 10 down to a 2, something along that lines. And it's a little bit, as we talked about yesterday too, a little bit 50, 75%, somewhere in that spectrum. But they have to get some level of relief um, from, that, from that injection. If there's confusion on the diagnosis, you really have to eliminate other stuff. You don't want to go ahead and give them a surgery and have it not work. So you really want to eliminate other possibilities or at least investigate them. And the most common in my practice with orthopedics is probably concomitant hip pain. And, uh, and I will have a, a lot of patients, I'll just cancel their pre-scheduled SI joint injection and change it to a hip injection if their exam and history suggests that it's the hip. And it's not always apparent on x-rays, but you really have to think about it. The other uh, very common one are facet issues. And you really want to uh, eliminate uh, the facets or address the facets or somehow kind of differentiate what's really causing it. And there's different ways to do that. You know, there's ablations and injections and branch blocks. Um, um, but I think in my practice anyway, I think it's it's kind of gone this way where I always address the hip first with hip replacement surgery and to do a lot of hips also. But if it's the back and they have concomitant SI and back issues, I think an easier surgery is actually to undergo the SI joint and see if you can get them down from an eight down to a three or a two instead of having to get a multi-level fusion. And uh, so we've kind of uh, addressed that and then given some ablations, remedial branch block, and then facet interarticular injections to see if we can't help them out down the road. And on occasion, they get the SI fusion, and then one or two years later, you know, the, the, the we talk about rescue valve concept, but that loss of motion in the SI joint can drive increased motion up above. And that's how it can kind of manifest with the increased back pain after a while. As an example for the hips, this patient's from my SI joint pain clinic. You know, they get an SI joint injection, gets it down to eight, down to a zero, but then they get a hip injection, they go from a seven to a one. And it's not super clear on the plain films that there is an obvious hip issue, but her exam and her history suggested hips. So we injected her hip, did well. So I said, you know, what we do is well, we're going to do your, your hips first. She has a cyst, posterior wear, and the CT scan. So if you guys do promise scores, I mean, this is her promise score and follow-up. Her SI joint pain is completely gone. She has the crossover sign with her outcome scores. So she did really well and avoided having to have her, uh, have her back done by restoring motion. And my idea is that when you have a super stiff hip, Every time you're moving your hip back and forth, you can measure your whole hemipelvis kind of rocking back and forth. You give them a brand new ball bearing, all of that posterior spine stress is relieved from the hip. So really look at the hip closely because that can be an absolute home run and avoid having to do the, uh, the, the SI joint. The facets can be a different issue. You know, here's a lady that uh, has had kind of this uh, EDS history and has you know, profound low back disease. I mean, this is, this is pretty bad. We get her uh, SI joints injected. She goes from, a, you know, down to a zero, gets facets, you know, it's 50% pain relief. But, you know, that's a much bigger surgery for her. So we go ahead and give her SI joints, and she's 100% better on her left, despite the bad facets in the back. Um, and the right's kind of getting better. And so she's uh, still a little bit of a work in progress, but, but, uh, but, but that's kind of the hits home with that concept. So in my practice, who gets surgery? Just like Dr. Sen's surge protocol, that's the four things you have to have positive. And then you are a surgical candidate if you have exhausted all non-operative measures. And the treatment options are great. I think that I really want to hit home that SI joint belt because it's a huge thing. And you can kind of see how the sacrum's sitting there like a V. And if you give a lateral to medial directed force on the SI joints, you're really allowing that, that, that sacrum to sit in the cradle in a much more firm point. So that's actually a diagnostic tool for me 
that if patients get better with a belt, there's instability going on there. So that, uh, that can be used kind of as a, you know, exam point number seven um, to help you. But when all else fails, surgery, if it's done well, works. And this is just some data from our practice for 100 uh, you know, or so patients. If you look at the, the, the uh, ODIs, you know, it gets better and better and better. And same thing with the pain scores um, out to a year there. And then the SANE score, which I love, is like how much of your SI joint pain is better. And you know they're getting 90 plus percent better, but they all a lot of them have other stuff going on. The SANE score does their best to isolate it down to just the SI joint. Um, so I ask all of our patients that. So with SI joint pain, how do you get successful fusions and get successful treatments? You know, it, I, I template everybody to, to maximize safety, um, you know, get good imaging. And there's a lot of different methods out there to fuse SI joints. And I'm not going to tell you that my wine is the best. There's a lot of them out there. And you have to choose the best ones for your patient. You know, what do I do? This is kind of my standard template for every single patient that I see. I template like this, everyone. So you just go into our fact system and type in my name and all my pre-ops will come up for years. But you know, this is the upper sacral segment. This is exactly what you saw yesterday in the lab. That's the trajectory that we typically go, kind of, kind of perpendicular to the joint axis, the SI joint. And uh, you know, our goals there are to avoid you know, uh, kind of where five and one are. Um, that's kind of where we're five, and then one's back there. You want to go right between them. Um, prone position, this is the grid that I drew out in that patient yesterday. This is how your sacrum is sitting. I'd have you draw this out on every single patient if you're going to go do this fluoroscopically. But that kind of shows the inlet. The inlet is for anterior posterior adjustments. Then we come around to the uh, outlet view. So you're looking right down. The inlet view is one on two. So that's why you have that double density. Now you go to the outlet view. And as you look at the outlet view, being that's how your sacrum is sitting. That's how your beam is hitting it. And that's how you do cranial caudal. And then you get that lateral view to look at the ICD, which a lot of you probably have some familiarity with. Um, just like where that same ex video is for the exam, I do have a video of showing how we do this and explains the inlet and outlet views really well. You know, the design rationale for, for, a tr for a fusion, I think this is how I just used to do them. And this is a really, really big deal as you're opening somebody up and you're just scraping it out. But this works, <laughs> it works really well. And this is how you get the most fusion mass is by scraping out the entire SI joint and then putting bone graft in there. So this, is, this works really well, especially if your end, end point's radiographic fusion. But I really think you need a true fusion in there to really maximize or, or get your predictable results. And you have to use these principles of fusion surgery, which anybody in here that does fusion surgery on any part of the body, this is how you do it. This is how I fuse list franks, ankles, elbows, knees. This is, this is just how we do it. And we also, this, I wanted a sound revision strategy. And all of these are fraught with some issues with, with I mean, these have the, the classical ha the halos around them, which is what happens when screws loosen inside uh, bone. And this is kind of the most common revision uh, indication in my practice. And we just recently wrote up, uh, wrote up our series. When you're doing, just like you saw yesterday in the lab, and what we'll do today in our lab, there's only two critical steps with doing the, what I think is a well done SI joint fusion. Number one, but that guide pin in, so you don't hit five and one. Once the guide pin's in there, it's just a recipe of you know, steps A through A through J, and you're done. Um, step two, a little bit looser, is just to find the SI joint so you can completely scrape it out and get rid of that cartilage and then bone graft it. By doing it this way, you can kind of get this good compression and stability across the SI joint, and you just lock this up. And like tongue and groove decking, if you have that indolations right there and you compress it, you're going to get instantaneous stability that's going to be maintained and held in that position uh, when the bone grows uh, together. So my post-op routine, weight bearing is tolerated right off the bat, just routine follow-up. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's it. So SI joint pain is real. It's not this voodoo diagnosis that we used to think about. So always look at it and consider it. Because if you're not looking, if you're not thinking about it, it's going to be looking right at you. It could come back to bite you. Um, treat them non-op and exhaust non-op before you can get, go right into surgery. Um, surgery does work. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things out there for you. I just think uh, just to concentrate on some principles of fusion uh, may help you maximize your benefits. So I'll uh, uh, close there and we can open up for a discussion now or we can do our small groups uh, um, in the lab. But these are just some great topics that I love to talk about as it pertains to SI joint fusion, fusion surgery. So thanks. Absolutely outstanding.
And, and please look at his exam thing. Uh, I want to harp on the bottom left um, category on your bullet point list, the long segment fusions. Yeah. We had an excellent presentation by Dr. Jay Turner. We saw beautiful yeah. images uh, artistically done with high tech by Dr. Pat Johnson. Long segment fusions. Mm -hmm. Should we routinely, when we put pelvic anchoring and fuse the SI joints, yes or no? So we, so we don't know yet, but we, we're just developing a randomized uh, controlled study at Mayo looking at that exact question to try, try and get good answers with it. But uh, as we kind of looked at my most common patients in my practice, it's after spine fusion surgery. And that, that, that motion transfer down to the SI joints is massive with these long segment fusions. So I think there is a significant role for SI joint surgery in, in combination with long segment fusions. I think, it, uh, I think these patients that are coming back two years and three years later are having SI joint disease. You inject them, they, they get better with the injections. So it follow that if you prophylactically fix them, they won't ever come back. Yes? Um, from your standpoint, if, if you go for a long fusion, is it better to fuse down to the pelvis using S2AI screws and violating the SI joint, or you'd rather say, don't destroy the SI joint and take it just a classic iliac screw and bridge the SI joint. So that's so that's that's I think that's the question because I have seen in my practice the S2AIs they have huge halos all around them or they break and that's I think you have a stationary implant across the SI and the SI is moving around it and that's a pain generator. So I think what I, in the way that I like to fuse it I I fuse it bone graft it compress it and then neutralize that in compression with S2AI screws and that's like the world's biggest anti rotation screw. One more question. Sorry, there's a question back here by Dr. Scott. Cody, thank you so much for uh, educating me on this. Yeah. Have you seen cases where people put in SAI screws that go across the joint that cause uh, SI joint problems? Usually it's, it's uh, delayed. It's usually not immediate. And uh, I think like any other transfixation implant, there's often a window of pain relief. And it can last for three weeks, it can last for three months, it can last for a year. But when, it, when the pain comes back, oftentimes there's a little bit of micromotion there. And I think the micromotion is over a stable implant is what causes recurrence of pain. So I haven't seen it immediately cause it, but it's usually in delayed manners. Dr. Sansford. So I, I have seen uh, pain caused by S2AI screws that are not perfectly placed. Let's say, for instance, you put your starting point in the SI joint as opposed into the S2 ALA. And so if you put it in the joint and then pierce the ilium, mm -hmm. um, it kind of like distracts the joint a little bit yeah. and, and, um, and then pierces the ilium. So it's kind of like a disruption. Um, so, you know, if, you're, if your starting point is more medial and then you traverse the joint, then it's not as much of a distraction. I find those patients you know, do fine. You know, there's a tendency to want to get your pelvic screw to line up perfectly with your S1 and L5 and L4 screws. And so you, the, the drive is to push your tulip head more lateral, but you capture less of the sacrum when you do that. So um, it's a challenge, and, and sometimes you may catch like a tiny like bit of the sacrum as part of your quote unquote S2 AI screw, but the truth is that you're not capturing any of the sacrum or barely capturing anything, and if anything, you're fracturing the sacrum into the SI joint and causing trouble. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just, I, I just want to take a step back. So I think we're falling into a knee-jerk reaction of my spine patient with a deformity doesn't do well. There's degeneration in the SI joint. 30% of people over the age of 65 go on to spontaneously fuse their SI joint. And we say, oh, there must be micromotion. So now I'm going to have to put that bedrock thing in and fuse them. That's where I want you to stop and go back to your exam, look at them, because there's multiple different things. It's I have a loose SI joint screw and I have muscle spasms over the screw head, which I think is not that uncommon in people. Yeah. I have a cluneal nerve irritation, which is another problem. I have back pain. Yeah. I have worker in's comp. And so I, I guess what I'm just trying to talk to the residents, it's not, your algorithm's not, and, and I'm just reinforcing your talk, your algorithm's not, did a long deformity, still has back pain. 
just put just fuse the SI joint, they're going to be better. I think you have to really think about it and put a lot of effort into it. And there's multiple different causes for it. And I think, and I'll say this, with every new technology, you hit the peak of everything, and then you come down to the realization of where it is. And I think we're still at the peak searching for where does the SI joint fusion fit in our algorithm. With the posterior prominent hardware of the of the S two AI screws, that gives you a false positive in your exam. So all of your posterior PSI distraction tests, you're pushing right on a tulip head, and that can masquerade as SI joint pain. So that can provide some confusion on where that pain's coming from. So that uh, that again, that I rely heavily on an injection differential trigger point on the tulip two weeks later, and accurately place SI joint injection. See what happens because that's a false positive exam. I think that's actually a pretty good guideline. My, my partner goes, in our practice, what we did is we made one guy in charge of it, and he sees all the patients. Yeah. And he has a very good algorithm, and it's a lot of physical exams. Mm -hmm. He makes them with three SI joint injections mm -hmm. with fluoroscopy to make sure the dye is in the joint when you get to the And I don't know his whole algorithm, but I really think you need to have someone who's, and like in your place at Mayo, you, you know the most about it. Now, let me ask you one more diagnostic question. I appreciate all the discussion about this. And again, yet again, we could go on all morning long on this. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, bone scans. I still love a Technician 99 bone scan with SPECT. I didn't see it in your workup. Uh, is that something that's an anachronism? Am I just an old guy with all the injections and stuff like that? Or is there still a role for TC99 SPECT? Yeah, so, I, so I think there's probably a role for it. I haven't had to have a role for it, just with, our, yeah. with the way that we diagnose it with our imaging and our exam and our injections. And uh, you know, a, a long, extensive history. We haven't had to use it um, routinely. But so there's probably still a role for it. And, and can you show us how to do the drop test to hold your laptop? <laughs> Dr. Everybody, Cross is performing. Uh, zoom in on him. <laughs> I only learned this master. But if they, have, uh, if they have right SI joint pain, if they can do it, they simply go up, and then you drop them down. And if they do that, they'll collapse down into their chair if they have that occult instability. So that is the drop test. And I'll have to add a little YouTube short on that one. <laughs> so one, one quick question, a follow-up to, uh, to the nuclear medicine studies, spec CT scanning along the same line? Do you use spec CT for diagnosis as part of it? We have, we have, I haven't gone into the specs before. There's, I think there is a clear role for, for those in some patients, especially with an equivocal diagnosis. And you're looking for more data before you embark on surgery. Any of those adjuncts are, are, are definitely appropriate, just not routine. Fantastic, Dave. We must move on. And with everybody's uh, one more round of applause. Thank you. Got it? No, no drop test on your laptop here. That was not a close call. So with your permission, we're going to skip one break here because this is so important and there's a flow here. That's a theme that I like to pursue. And uh, talking about, again, the expansion of spine, we omitted pediatric surgery for way too long. And we have